Let's rise up for the reading of God's word and turn with me to the seventh chapter of Acts uh, from verse 1. We read about eight verses. We are supposed to break down three chapters, so what we'll do is that we'll keep reading and skipping some. I'm giving you time to open your Bible. We highly encourage people here to carry physical Bible, like physical Bible, because it's, it's a good thing. It's a good thing. Ask your neighbor, umefika chapter gani sasa? We, by now we should be done with the 28 chapters. We should be doing like our third, our third reading. Yeah, third reading. Okay, the Bible says, Then the high priest asked him, Are these charges true? To this he replied, Brothers and si No, 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 we are used to sisters. It is fathers. Brothers and fathers, listen to me. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham while he was still in Mesopotamia. In a kumbuka, something that we read. See, a glaring revolution in Mesopotamia. Yes. Before he lived in Haran, leave your country and your people, God said, and go to the land that I will show you. So he left the land of the Chaldeans and settled in Haran. After the death of the, his father, God sent him to this land where you are now living. He gave him no inheritance here, not even a foot of ground. But God promised him that he and his descendants after him would possess the land, even though at that time Abraham had no child. God spoke to him in this way. Your descendants will be strangers in a country, not their own. And they will be enslaved and mistreated 400 years. But I will punish the nation they serve as slaves. And God said, and afterwards they will come out of the country and worship me in this place. Verse 8, then he gave Abraham the covenant of circumcision. And Abraham became the father of Isaac. And circumcised him eight days after his birth. Later, Isaac became the father of Jacob. And Jacob became the father of the twelve patriarchs. We thank you, Lord, for your word. We pray that your word will be so real to us. Break it down for us in the best way that we can understand. So that it will be easy for us to apply your word. And this is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, today we look at our fourth piece. Uh, remember, we looked at conviction, church, community. And today we look at our fourth piece, and the fourth piece is commission. Commission. And we see the call to spread the gospel. We are called to spread the gospel of Jesus. Stephen here, who is a deacon, he's now been arrested and is addressing these people, the Sanhedrin, people who are highly elevated in the Jewish culture because they were the people who are training people on the law and defending the law. And Stephen, in just one chapter, summarizes the history of Jews from the call of Abraham all the way to the coming of the Messiah. He shared the powerful, this powerful message about the promises of God that he promised his children of Israel. In chapter 7, Stephen's powerful testimony and his boldness in proclaiming the gospel, even in the face of opposition, serves as an inspiration to believers. Now, we honestly cannot share the gospel of Jesus if we do not have the word of God in us, it is very clear that Stephen understood his history. He understood the history of his faith. And that is something that you and I need to understand. That's why we need to read the word of God daily. There's a song we sang in Sunday school. Read your Bible, pray every day. Read your Bible, pray every day. When you guys didn't go to Sunday school? I'm a Malikom Nimbagani. Read your Bible, pray every day. 
It is so important for us to read the word of God daily. And for Stephen, it was very easy for him to explain how Abraham to uh, the promises and the 12 patriots going down to Egypt and then Moses coming to deliver them and then they are in the wilderness. They are worshipping in a tabernacle all the way to the coming of the Messiah, Jesus. And he continued preaching the gospel powerfully and he says, you stiff-necked people, that is verse 51, with uncircumcised hearts and tears and ears, you are just like your father's. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Was there over ever a prophet your fathers did not persecute? They even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one. And now you have betrayed and murdered him. You have received the law that was put in, into effect through angels, but have not obeyed it. See, he's, he's has a lot of conviction and courage. He's boldly sharing the gospel of Jesus. So my question is, is this to you. Are you bold enough to share the gospel of Jesus? Are you courageous enough to share the gospel of Jesus? His unwavering commitment to sharing the message of salvation teaches us the importance of being courageous and dedicated in spreading the good news to all people, regardless of the challenges that we face. So we ought to be in a space where we are bold enough and courageous enough to share the gospel of Jesus. And you know what, friends? Whenever we share the gospel of Jesus, the world will not like it. And the world will bring our way trouble. That is what happened to Stephen. When they heard this, they were furious and they gnashed their teeth at him. Verse 54. But Stephen... Full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. At this they covered their ears and yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed at him, dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he fell asleep. Now, we see some boldness that is here with Stephen. That even when he's going through pain, when he's being persecuted, he's bold enough to stand and forgive even the people that are persecuting him. It is only through God that you can boldly do such things that Stephen did. That he was able to stand and say, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. And if we are to spread the gospel of Jesus, we require such a high level of courage and dedication and commitment. Now think with me. Think with me. There's a gentleman here called Saul who is supervising the persecution of Stephen. He's a guy who's standing there to make sure that Stephen Amekufa, that he's dead. And then later, he gets converted in chapter 9. He starts spreading the gospel of Jesus. Now think with me getting to heaven, and we have Stephen here, and the guy who persecuted him is here in the same heaven. That's the joy of this uh, relationship that we talk about, or this faith that we talk about, that God is able to transform his people, and we are coming to that shortly. He's able to transform his people. But yet, here when we get persecuted, kidogo too, we, we, we give up on our faith. We forget our faith. We hate on people. We don't love people again. But God's desire is that even when we are persecuted, we can still extend the grace and the love of God. So my question to you is, can you love people who persecute you? Can you accept them? Can you embrace them? Do you have the courage to continue sharing the gospel of Jesus? Because persecution will come. And persecution is not necessarily a bad thing. 
Yeah, persecution sometimes will come to refine us. Because gold gets refined. And it is refined through fire. Because chapter 1 verse 8 of Acts, Jesus is telling the disciples, you become my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the world. But it is until chapter 8 verse 1 where this is happening. See verse 1 of chapter 8. And Saul was there giving approval to his death. On that day, the day that Stephen died, great persecution broke out against the church at Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered. Throughout Judea and Samaria, godly men buried Stephen and they mourned deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy the church Going from house to house, he dragged off men and women and put them in prison. And then Philip goes to Samaria, shares the gospel, this, and, and, and our whole city believes. Then we see Simon the sorcerer getting converted. Then we see Philip again meeting the Ethiopian eunuch, eunuch and, the, and, the, and the, the gospel is now coming into Africa. So persecution is not necessarily a bad thing. Tell your neighbor, persecution is not necessarily a bad thing. Yeah, it's not a bad thing. Yeah, it's, it's part of the journey. It's part of the, part of the, part of our journey of faith. So even when we get persecuted, we should celebrate. And, and persecution will not just come through stoning. No, there will be different versions of persecution. And your persecution is not my persecution. Yeah. And depending on what God desires to do with you, man, he'll take you through fire. And guys will wonder, how is he putting his life together amidst all this fire that he's going through? Yeah. But you say, God is doing something amazing through me and through my life. Is it, is it Job who asked the wife, shall we only accept good things from God? And when pain, which I equate to persecution, comes our way, then we forget that he is God and he loves us. So persecution will come to grow and to scatter. Sometimes it's good to scatter. It's a good thing sometimes to scatter. So that we go and share the gospel of Jesus. That's why we scatter every Sunday after the service. We scatter. You go and share your gospel in your place. In your car. You know, sometimes when we are in church, there's so much peace here. So much peace. People are so kind to you. People are so pious. Yeah, but out there, man, life is not as, as peaceful as it is here. But when you are persecuted and you go through pain, will you boldly, like Stephen, keep sharing the gospel of Jesus? Or will you give up and turn back? And I think I've said that here. But whenever you go through pain, guess where you're supposed to be found? You're supposed to be found in that faith even more. You're supposed to, to, to dive deeper in that faith even more. So persecution is a good thing. So before you pray against some pain that you could be going through, before you pray against some persecution, ask God, what are you doing with me? Oh, yeah. By the way, we've seen sometimes war in Ukraine, in Syria, and such like places. These are landlocked countries where no gospel is ever heard, where no Bible is ever sold. And when there is war, when they are running to save their lives, they interact with Christians in Europe. And they receive Jesus. So before you start saying to we to Nakemea, yeah, we decree and declare. Before you say that. Ask God, what are you doing with me? Yeah. Maybe even that loss of that job, it could be God is still doing hallelujah. Great things in your life. Yeah. And you find yourself in a space where you can't now avoid life there. You come life here because there are other guys that God wanted to share the gospel with. Hey, Apo Kusema, amen, in kuanga kazi, eh? Yeah. Yeah, the same, same God who can give you a new car is the same God who can take it away because he's, he's, he's teaching you something. Because he's God. Oh, yeah. 
The same God who can give you good health is the same God who can withdraw that good health for a season because there's something he's doing with you and with your life. So we need to ask ourselves, what is this persecution that is coming my, my way? And is it helping me to become a better Christian? Is it helping me grow in my faith? But the second thing that we see, the second lesson that we learn is the conversion of Saul. Now, Saul is doing so much work to destroy the church. To destroy these believers. By then they were not even called Christians. They were called followers of the way. In fact, to the Jews then, this was a sect. But see chapter 9. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them at, as prisoners to Jerusalem. And as he neared Damascus on his journey, Suddenly, a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you'll be told what to do. The men traveling with Saul stood there, there speechless. They heard the sound, but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. In Damascus there was a disciple named Ananias. And the Lord called to him in a vision. Ananias, he said, yes, Lord. Go to the house of Judas on straight street. And ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him and restore his sight. In verse 12, Ananias is wondering, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. Now, chapter 9 recounts the incredible transformation of Saul. This is a zealous persecutor of Christians who is being converted into an apostle. And the dramatic conversion that we see here demonstrates the bowed, boundless grace and mercy of God. We get to see the grace of God and the mercy of God. We get to see that God is able to convert Anybody, like anybody. You know, there are some people you see and you see hell direct. There are people that, who are your relatives? Some could be your siblings. And you see them and you're like, these ones. I, I, when I see them, I see for sure there's hell. Because there must be somewhere that these guys will get punished. That was Saul. But see, God is converting him and speaking to Ananias. Ananias, who loved God and, and, and was a believer, is thinking, how can I even trust this guy? I have heard what this guy is doing to the church. This guy cannot become one of us. He cannot become a disciple. And that is what we always see. We see people who don't look like it. But guess what? Those could be the people that God is expecting you to share the gospel with and share and pray for because they will become great ministers of the gospel. Oh, yeah. No one is beyond redemption. And God can radically change the hearts and lives of even the most hardened individuals. Those people that you look at and you think these ones cannot, imagine God is able to transform them. Those neighbors who give you sleepless night because they, they don't know peace. Those are the ones that God expects you to pray for and share the gospel of Jesus with because God is able to transform them and use them. 
You know, I saw something this week where uh, some, some guy had his house broken into and it's a chuma door, like this metal door and he asked, Yanni, my neighbors, none of you had when these guys were breaking into my house. And they said, we had. But we are happy that the woofer has been stolen. Now we can sleep in peace. Now even that guy, that guy, can become the best minister of the gospel. Even that guy that you think he can't. Paul's conversion serves as a powerful example of God's transformative power and the potential for anyone to become a passionate preacher of the gospel. So anyone, it doesn't matter how deep you've fallen, it doesn't matter how dark a life you've lived. It doesn't matter. You can become different. You might look at yourself and wonder, oh, I, I don't think I qualify. You can disqualify yourself because you're looking at your past history. You're looking at the things you've done. And you're thinking, no, I don't think I belong to this place. But you know what? Paul became the greatest apostle who put together a third of the New Testament, other than Jesus, the other person who has affected the church and influenced the church is Paul. All that Jesus taught was explained better by Paul on how to live as a Christian. This is a guy who wanted to destroy the church and eventually he ended up building the church. So please don't give up on those people. Don't give up on those people. Don't give up on your husband. Maybe he doesn't want to hear anything about church. Don't give up on your children. Don't give up on your siblings. Don't give up on your colleagues. They keep mocking you. They keep crap, cracking jokes about born again people. God is able to transform them. Only trust in him and pray for them. But the third lesson that we see is Paul is stiffing, performing miracles here. The witness and victories of Peter. Chapter 9. Should be verse 32. As Peter traveled about the country, he went to visit the saints in Lida. And there he found a man named Aeneas a paralytic who had been bedridden for eight years. Any years, Peter said to him, Jesus Christ heals you. Get up and take care of your mat. Immediately, any years got up. All those who lived in Lida and Sharon saw him and turned to the Lord. In Joppa, there was a disciple named Tabitha, which when translated is Dorcas, who was always doing good. And helping the poor. About that time she became sick and died. And her body was washed and placed in an upstairs room. Lida was near Joppa. So when the disciples heard that Peter was in Lida. They sent two men to him and urged him. Please come at once. And Peter went with him. And when he arrived he was taken upstairs to the room. All the widows stood there around him, crying and showing him the robes and other clothing that Dorcas had made while she was still with them. And Peter sent them all out of the room. Then he got down on his knees and prayed, turning toward the dead woman. He said, Tabitha, get up. She opened her eyes and seeing Peter, she sat up. He took her by the hand and helped her to her feet. Then he called the believers and widows and presented her to them alive. She became known all over Joppa. This became known all over Joppa. And many people believed in the Lord. Peter stayed in Joppa for some time with a tanner named Simon. Now, chapter 9 here highlights these acts of healing performed by Peter. And through the healing of Aeneas and raising of Tabitha from the dead, Peter's witness confirms the power and authority of Jesus Christ. And these miracles that we see, these two miracles that we see here, do not only bring physical healing, but they serve as a testimony of the truth of the gospel. And these miracles are supposed to inspire us in our hearts as believers 
and provide evidence of God's presence and work among his people. You know, sometimes when we read this, about these miracles, we think that miracles ended with the apostles. And we think that in our generation, we don't, or we should not be having miracles. We should not be witnessing miracles. In fact, these days, we are living in miracle-free churches. Yeah. Because we, we kind of don't believe that, they, that miracles can still happen in our generation. But we see something happening here. Aeneas, who's been paralyzed for 10 years. Peter performs a miracle. And Tabitha Dorcas is dead. People have declared her gone. But God performs a miracle. <laughs> we believe in God healing flu, but not terminal illness. Oh, yeah. We believe that he can heal our headache, he can heal that, but you don't believe that he can replace a liver. Yeah. We need to grow our faith, guys. We need to rise up and say that the same God who performed miracles then can also perform miracles now. And when he performed miracles, many people believed. There's some miracles that God will need to do so that we may have many believing in Jesus. So that we may have many believing in that God who is able to perform miracles. That God who was able to open dead wombs can open wombs again. That God who was able to heal those, those diseases, he can do that again. And we should be inspired to stand in faith and trust in God for powerful and great miracles. We need to live in a generation where we can evidently witness miracles and his presence, which is still at work today. His presence is still at work today. And he's still performing miracles. He didn't stop working miracles, working out miracles. No, he's still performing miracles today. And he still can perform. As I was reading this, I felt we need to see miracles happening today. So that even many more people may believe in this Jesus. But finally, we see the growth of the church. Acts chapter 9 portrays the rapid growth of the early church. As more people came to faith in Jesus Christ, the community of believers expanded and flourished. This growth was not only in numbers, but also in spiritual maturity and unity. The early church became a vibrant community of believers who supported and cared for one another, sharing their resources and living out the teachings of Jesus. And this growth here serves as a model for us today. Reminding us of the importance of fostering a thriving community of believers who can encourage and challenge one another in their faith. So this, this, this growth is not just growth in numbers. It is okay, we desire to grow and we are trusting that we can grow in numbers. But this growth should also be our spiritual maturity. That now we cannot be tossed back and forth by every wind of doctrine but we can stand the test of time as believers. That is the growth that we ought to witness today. And because church is different without you, we need to grow so that we may keep challenging each other, that we may keep supporting each other, that we may keep standing with each other, that we may keep fanning the gifts of each other into flames so they're able to stand and testify about the goodness of our God. So are you growing spiritually? Are you growing in your level of faith? May God grow us that we can believe in our God opening an opportunity, but we can also believe in him giving us a promotion and expanding us and growing us in every way. That we will not only believe in him for small things, but those big things, I, those ones, but we need to grow our faith as believers and stir each other up that we may keep believing and trusting and knowing that he is our God who is able to transform our lives. Shall we pray?
We've been given a commission. And the commission is to go and share the gospel of Jesus. We can only share that gospel if we've matured. If we've matured. If we've witnessed spiritual maturity. We're able to share the gospel. And maybe that's why God brought you here to church today. That you may believe in him as your Lord and Savior. I want to give you a chance to believe in him today. I want to give you a chance to trust in him today. I want to give you a chance today to give your life to him. The Bible records that there is a party that is thrown in heaven when one sinner believes in Jesus. So are you there and you've not given your life to Jesus? Are you there and you'd like to receive him today? I want to give you a chance today to believe in him. Yes, you come to church, it's a good thing, but you've never given your life to Jesus. I want to give you this opportunity. If you're here, you'd like to receive Jesus, lift up your hand wherever you are, and we'll pray together. We'll pray together. He throws a party in heaven whenever one sinner believes in him. Lift up your hand wherever you are, and we'll pray together. We'll pray together. Don't be ashamed. Thank you for that hand. Thank you for that hand. We need to believe in him. That is why he brought you here today. That you may believe in him. Don't be ashamed. Don't be embarrassed. Oh, he's your father. He's calling you back home. He's telling you, my son, my daughter. That's why I gave my life for you. That's why I died for you. He died for all of us. He died for all of us. Lift that hand up. Don't be ashamed. Don't be embarrassed. You could be wondering, how will I live life again now? Because I was so used to this lifestyle. Jesus will teach you how to. Jesus will show you how to. Jesus will guide you because he's God. Our Father and our Lord, we thank you for saving that soul. We thank you, Lord, because now there's a party in heaven. Because one soul has come to you. Oh, Jesus, what a faithful God you are that you are still in the business of performing miracles, God. I want to commit these men and women before you that God will grow us as people. You will grow our faith. You will mature our faith. That God, we may not only believe you for small things, but we may believe you for great things. That is why this evening, God, I take power and authority to declare healing upon your people. In the name of Jesus, may we receive our healing in Jesus' name. I decree and declare that the same God who healed Aeneas is able to heal our diseases today. The same God who resurrected Tabitha is able to resurrect every dead situation today. God, as a church, we stand and speak resuscitation of our economy in this nation in the name of Jesus. God, many people have lost their businesses. They've lost their jobs. And today they are wondering, how do we face the future? My God, you are able to bring all that is dead back to life. You are able to speak to those dead bones and resurrect them. And we take power and authority today to speak to those dead situations today and declare resurrection in the name of Jesus. God, I thank you because you are good. I know that you are doing mighty things and you are performing miracles. And I know that on this very pulpit will hear testimonies of your goodness and your doings. Because you are well able. God, we thank you. Because you've heard our prayer today. And there is, I know there is manifestation of your goodness and your glory in our lives. You speak upon those dead marriages that God you may resurrect them again. We speak upon those dead businesses and we know that God you can resurrect them again. In the name of Jesus. Father, break everything, every element that could be hindering your flow in our lives. That Lord you may experience your power. In the name of Jesus, we pray and believe. Amen. Shall we put our hands together and celebrate Jesus? He's, he's a good father and a good Lord. Let's rise on our feet.